and welcome to Leaders Up Close and Personal. This program is part of UCF's Engineering Leadership and Innovation Institute. We thank Duke Energy for their support. And we thank today John White, who's joining us, to share his views on leadership. So John, we've interacted a little bit, and there's kind of three topics I'd like to explore with you. And the first one is, what is your leadership style? What's your view of leadership? Tim, I could spend far more time than we have to answer that sure. question, but let me try to be very brief. My leadership style basically is to assemble a great team and let them do their jobs, and I'm not going to do their jobs for them. But I tend to be more of a facilitator. I want to be the umbrella I put over the team and protect them from outside influences and pressures and let them be about doing their job. I, I characterized my leadership style to a group there at the University of Arkansas as being kudzu management. And I said kudzu is a plant that grows throughout the southeastern part of the United States and you can't see it growing, but if you turn your head and look back, it will have grown. And I said, you won't see the progress we're going to make day to day, but you look back in five years and you'll see a tremendous amount of progress, but you wait for 10 years and you're not gonna believe the amount of progress. So we set the goals, we stay after the goals, we are persistent, we're patient, we pursue. Mm -hmm. Those three Ps are very, very important with what we're doing there. So my style is to, is to lead, not manage, mm -hmm. and to set the tone and make sure the tone at the top is one that's of integrity and character and that we will be honest with one another there will be a trust relationship and that they keep me informed. That's basically, I don't like surprises. Sure. So how did, new into the job, mm -hmm. how did you how did you build that bridge of trust? What did you have to do to help them trust you? It was very difficult, the transition that occurred. Uh, the person that I succeeded had spent his entire academic career there at the University of Arkansas. I got my undergraduate degree, I left, I was gone for 36 years, I came back in. Um, it, took, it took three years before people finally understood, mm -hmm. I think, that what I was striving for was going to be good for everyone. Um, unfortunately, there are those who look at a pie and they think, if you get a bigger slice, I get a smaller slice. I was trying to create the environment that said, let's make the pie bigger right. so everyone gets a bigger slice. Um, so it's just changing attitudes and expectations was my biggest challenge. Okay. Uh, that when I went there, back to my alma mater, mm -hmm. uh, I went around the state and I asked at civic clubs, who do you want the University of Arkansas to compete with in football? And they would say, Texas and Alabama and Florida and you name it and you know who they would pick right. about basketball they'd say Duke and Carolina and Kentucky and then I said what about history and there was silence in the room what about English what about engineering what about mathematics mm -hmm. then they would begin to say universities I said understand I want to compete academically with the same institutions with which you aspire that we compete athletically. There is no university that year in and year out can have a dominant athletic program without having a very high quality academic reputation. Right. There are no exceptions to that. You can look back over it. Stanford wins the cup for the most success in athletics and it's a very fine institution. University of Michigan winds up winning lots of athletic, very fine academic institutions. Same with Duke, mm -hmm. same with North Carolina. Okay, so you can go through and, and recognize that people's attitudes had to change. We need to raise their expectations. Sure. So I set up a benchmark set of 54 national public universities, including Arkansas, and I began to benchmark against them. I set up a report card, and every year I would report how we were doing in these categories. I set goals for the year 2010. I set those in 1997, and every year we would look at how we were doing against those goals. So some of that is, you talk about it's a journey, and you're not gonna see success always. It's about looking back five years, which it sounds like you helped them see it every year. We're on this journey, we're making progress. 
Yeah, well, I, I knew where we wanted to get, so I would calculate what's the annual compound growth rate that has to occur, so for each of those. And so each year we would look and say, hey, we're making progress, we're making progress. Inch by inch by inch. I mean, what is it? The Chinese proverb, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Yeah. We were taking the steps one at a time. But it took a while for people to begin to see that. And another thing was I kept trying to deliver the message of why are we here? We're here about the students. It's all about the students. We got a $300 million gift from the Walton family, which was then and still is the largest gift to a public institution nationally. When I stepped down from announcing that, one of our broadcast journalism students came up and said, tell me, Chancellor White, how does it feel to have a dream come true? I said, what do you mean? She said, $300 million must be a dream come true. I said, the $300 million is very important, gonna make a difference, but let me tell you something. My dream came true when you decided to come to the University of Arkansas. She said, what do you mean? I said, you came as a freshman in 1998. Mm -hmm. I came here in 97, went all over the state, talked about come and join me in a journey to excellence, help me make this a great university. And we had only 41 Chancellor Scholars when I came in 97. And those of you that answered the call, we had 492 the next year. Wow. You and 491 others have transformed this institution. She said, how'd you know I was in the class of 98? Sydney, I knew you were. I said, you gave more than $300 million. You gave everything you had. You gave yourselves. And all I've been trying to do since is deliver on my promise to you, we'd make these the best four years of your life. So it's that kind of message, trying to get the message out that it's all about the students. It's about yeah. giving them opportunity and hope. And that's what we're in the business of delivering. So related to that and education and, and hope and building folks, why is engineering leadership education important? You know, wh why spend time and energy in that field? Well, there is a, there are a paucity of impeccable leaders out there, mm -hmm. okay? Leadership is a scarce commodity in this country right now. And everyone needs to step up to the leadership challenge I think the nation's facing. But it's particularly true in engineering. And industry certainly is telling us we need more emphasis on leadership. That's how it really began. But then you look, and I believe that engineering students today are different from engineering students in my generation when I was studying. Many of us back in that day were studying engineering to get a good job, to make a great living. Mm -hmm. Today, our students want to get an engineering education to make a difference in the world. There's a greater sense of social responsibility among our students today than I have ever seen. They want to make a difference. Yes. And you know how you make a difference? You make a difference through people. So if you're going to make that difference, then you've got to be able to lead people. It is essential that our engineering majors, when they come out, they are equipped to step into leadership positions. That's how they're going to make the biggest difference in the world. Right. It's through leadership. Yeah. So speaking of leadership and education and making a difference, someone's going to ask you, and I've heard you talk about we are born and we have this granite and we're going to sculpt our life. So you've sculpted a life. What's John White's legacy? Well, you know, at the end of my day, I want to be able to claim, as the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in his second letter, I fought the good fight, I finished the course, I kept the faith, and I want to add I made a difference. That's what I want to do is make a difference, make a difference in the lives of people. That's what I'm trying to do as an educator. And every time I walk into that classroom, I realize I'm given an opportunity to make a difference in the life of one of these young people. It reminds me of a story, I'm sure you've heard it, of the person who was out walking on the beach and saw someone early in the morning, the sun was coming up, he was sort of blinded, saw this young man dancing along. As he got closer, he saw that that young man was picking up starfish. Thousands had washed up on the beach, throwing them back into the ocean. And the old man said to the young man, why are you doing that? You can't save them all. The young man picked one up and threw it out and he said, 
I saved that one. It's we measure our success one student at a time. Yeah. That's how I measure my success. And so if I can have, I can make a difference in the life of one young person, that's what I'm about. My sense is you've probably done that more than for one student. I've heard you share your story with our students. And there was 95 impacted today. There was 10 of us that were impacted. So John White, I'm sure your legacy is way solid. I don't need to share that, but I thank you for sharing your time. This has been Leaders Up Close and Personal. and We do thank John White for joining us. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's great to be at the University of Central Florida. Exciting things are happening. I don't know of another university that has recognized and stepped up to the need the way you have here, Tim. Congratulations on appreciate that. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you.